my words. Thanks, Lise. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name's James. Uh, great to see you and uh, great to be in John's Gospel tonight. Um, third year university, uh, my wife turned up to a pure maths honours stream or something. She's a nerd. Um, and uh, they kind of, you do that weird thing at the beginning of each course where you introduce each other and uh, talk about what course you're doing, you know, engineer, engineer, maths, whatever else. And she said primary teaching. And this young man kind of looked down his nose at her and said, what are you doing here? Like, this is pure maths. Um, she didn't think that was a great thing to do, and so they kept going. The point of this is that we make judgments on people on the basis of the work they do. And we decide that someone studying primary teaching shouldn't be doing pure maths. Uh, someone tells us that they're studying medicine, and we assume they've got really bad handwriting. Uh, someone tells you they're studying law and you sh assume they're very argumentative. The work we do says something about who we are. Here's the question tonight. What work does Jesus do? What work does Jesus do? Because by John chapter 5, this has become a massive question, particularly for Jesus' enemies. Uh, Jesus had put the final nail in his coffin, if you like, um, in verse 17 that we looked at last week. Jesus answered the Jewish leaders this way, My father is working until now, and I am working. And just in case that wasn't entirely clear, he makes it clear in verse 18. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill Jesus, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. You can't just go around claiming to be God. That's a sin punishable by death, according to the law. You can't say things like that and expect to get away with it, at least for the Jewish leaders. So what is the work that Jesus does? And more than that, why does it matter to us? Sure, Claiming to be equal with God the Father meant that Jesus was on this road to being killed. But why does that matter to us? Why does it matter what work He does? What bearing does it have on this week in your life? Should we be even interested in what Jesus' work is? Here's one thought. Um, sometimes we pray the Lord's Prayer here and uh, we pray the words, God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But here's the thing, like, what is God's will? How do you know if God has answered that prayer or not? Uh, sometimes people will say, you know, I want to live to glorify God. Again, unless you know what God's interested in, what, God, what the work God is doing, it's very hard to know how to glorify Him at all. So, three questions this, morning, uh, this, uh, this evening. First of all, what work does Jesus do? Secondly, how does Jesus do His work? And thirdly, can we trust Him? First of all, what does Jesus do? Uh, just skimming through the first half of chapter 5 uh, from last week, um, we saw the healing of the kind of long-term invalid, this guy who'd been unable to move for 38 years. Uh, it's a great, interesting story in lots of ways, but it was surprising. See, normally when Jesus does something amazing like this, uh, the crowd gets bigger or people are amazed or more people start following Jesus. Uh, that's, none of those things happen in John chapter 5. The only responses to what Jesus does here are negative. More than that, Jesus' interactions with the long-term invalid here are really strange if you look back at them again. Remember the first question he asked the man, uh, end of verse 6, do you want to be healed? I mean, you can't say, oh, that's a weird question to ask. Like, why would you say that to someone? Well, by asking these unusual questions, by saying these unusual things, John the writer is kind of highlighting things for us. He wants us to reckon with the work of Jesus. Jesus has come to bring life, to restore people, to make people better. But more than that, see, these miracles aren't just miracles in John's Gospel, they're signs, they point to something beyond themselves, they point to a bigger purpose. Jesus' bigger project, if you like. 
Uh, look at the second thing the, uh, that Jesus says to the man. A bit further on, he, he meets him in the temple and says this, Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. Which just sounds really kind of confronting and weird. But again, Jesus is making an important point about his work. The, this healing wasn't just about a healing. He's not just randomly healing a random guy for no particular reason. He's making a point. He doesn't come primarily to do healings at all. He's come to heal spiritually, to deal with sin, to deal with the problem of sin, which is death and judgment. He's come to save us from God's coming judgment, to bring life. Uh, the key verse in this chapter, if you look down at verse 24, is this. Um, so if you want to take one verse from this chapter away and reflect on it, this is it. Verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, says Jesus, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but pass from death to life. Here's the work of Jesus. What is the work of Jesus? To bring life. How do we receive this life? Well, we hear what Jesus says. We listen to him. Not like the healed man, the healed man in John chapter 5, who just wanted to kind of dob on Jesus and avoid getting in trouble with the Jewish leaders. And not like the Jewish leaders, who hear Jesus' claims and decide to kill him. Jesus got something to say about them. Verse 40, look down there, verse 40. You refuse to come to me that you might have life. I've come to give life, to restore, to redeem, to rescue, and you don't want a part of it. What does that mean for us? If you've embraced the life that Jesus offers, you've done the very thing that Jesus came to offer. If you've actually put your trust in Jesus... You've done the very thing he came to earth to make possible. There might be any number of other struggles you have this year. Some of us are struggling with a whole bunch of things now. But if we put our trust in Jesus, he promises life. Redemption. Beyond this life. Um, some of you had the, never had the fortune to watch this great old movie, Braveheart, with William Wallace. It's vaguely based on history, but not really. Uh, William Wallace uh, apparently said these words, every man dies, but not every man really lives. Which is true, to a point, if you'll excuse the lack of gender-neutral language. Uh, life isn't found by following a Scottish revolutionary. If we've read John 5, we know that life is found by following Jesus. So the next question then, how does Jesus bring life? If that's his job, if that's his number one agenda, how does Jesus actually bring life? John chapter 5 tells us that Jesus works with his Father to bring life. Which really doesn't make any sense to us. I mean, if you've been in a youth group before, you will have spent countless hours having arguments about the Trinity. How does the Father and the Son work? And that kind of thing. This chapter is going to help us tonight, actually. But this whole question of working with the Father doesn't make sense to us. Let me tell you why. When I grew up, I learned a little bit about the work my dad did. Early on, I had no idea. I just could observe that he worked hard and got tired and stressed. Um, I then learned about he was in some kind of human resource management and apparently that wasn't very fun and he didn't like trade unions very much but that's about as much as I knew about what he did and frankly that's all I know now. I was determined not to do anything like that. My work was going to make a difference. I was going to play cricket for Australia. I was certainly not going to have a stressful job and I was certainly not going to work with people. That was dumb. Didn't work out very well. That is, 
in our kind of modern Western world, we can make choices about the work we do. In the first century, you didn't have that choice. If your father was a fisherman, you learned how to mend nets. If your father was a farmer, you learned how to rotate crops. Your work wasn't determined by a university entrance score or the advice of a school careers counsellor. Your work was determined by what your dad did. Whatever he did, you did. So when Jesus says he does the work of the Father, there's nothing surprising about that in one sense, except he's not talking about carpentry. He's not talking about Joseph, his earthly father. He's talking about his Father in heaven. My Father is working until now, verse 17, and I am working. There's nothing wrong with being a carpenter. No one will kill you for learning carpentry. But they will kill you for claiming to work with God the Father, for calling him my Father. Here's the thing, anyone can say that they work with God the Father. Anyone can promise life even. Any snake oil salesman can promise you the world but deliver very little. The first century had plenty of people trumpeting their great claims. Jesus was unremarkable in that sense. What makes Jesus special is this claim that he works with God himself to bring life. That's the basis for his claim. I work with the Father to bring life. Have a look at verse 21. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Back in chapter 18, we saw that the big problem here, not just calling Jesus his Father, was making himself equal with God. But here's the thing, just because it's an equal partnership doesn't make their work identical. It's not an identical partnership. They have different responsibilities. Their their equality is worked out in different ways. They love each other, but their love is expressed differently. Now, this is hard, for our, again, for our modern world to get our heads around. In our world, being equal means doing the same thing. That's not the picture of equality between the Father and the Son. Let me give you a couple of examples. What we see here is that the Son loves the Father, and therefore, he obeys the Father. Verse 19, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. So with the healing of the man in John 5, Jesus is kind of saying, it was my dad's idea, it was great, it was a really good idea. Just a shame the guy didn't do anything good with it. Jesus is dependent on his Father. He does what his Father wants. Verse 30, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. What does Jesus do? He does the will of his Father. In perfect obedience. Like all my children. No, no, it's not true. Um, Jesus' work is perfectly matched with the work of his Father. Um, I don't know if you've played that broken telephone game where you kind of line people up and uh, you give the first person in the line a phrase to uh, repeat. They, you know, turn around, repeat the person behind them and so on and so forth. And you kind of compare the phrase at the beginning with the phrase at the end. And so you, you know, start with the phrase, I'm walking in a winter wonderland and by the tenth person it's become Ian's worried about William's thyroid gland. And we all go, ho, 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 that's brilliant, isn't it? Um, with the work of Jesus... His work is always perfectly aligned with the work of the Father. He doesn't run off and do his own thing. He doesn't change direction. Oh, the old man doesn't know what he's doing. I should really do this. No. It's a perfect partnership. They've been doing this together forever. The Son loving the Father in perfect obedience. But here's the other dynamic. Not just that the Son loves the Father and so is obedient. But the Father loves the Son and so grants all things to Him. Look at verse 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows Him all that He Himself is doing. 
It's not just about the obedience and humility of the Son, but also of this incredible humility of the Father. Verse 21, For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom He will. For the Father judges no one, but's given all judgment to the Son. Verse 26, For as the Father has life in Himself, so He's granted the Son also to have life in Himself. Here's the reason you really can't afford to mess with Jesus. Look at what the Father has entrusted to the Son. Judgment and life. If you want to be friends with God, you need to be friends with Jesus. It's not enough to say that you believe in God even. It's not sufficient to say that you believe that God exists. What matters, what determines our eternal destiny is how we respond to Jesus. He's been entrusted by the Father to grant life or execute judgment. Verse 23, look down there. Whoever does not honour the Son does not honour the Father who sent him. You can't go around Jesus to get to the Father. You can't. Which is the problem with every other religion in all history and all time. See, so many people are happy to talk about God, but not so happy to talk about Jesus. See, with the coming of Jesus, everything has changed. Verse 28, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who've done good to the resurrection of life, those who've done evil to the resurrection of the judgment. Um, I'm not sure if you've wandered through uh, Waverley Cemetery recently. You know, it's not kind of fun times to do. Uh, but on my kind of lockdown walks last year, I'd you know, walk along the coast and see Waverley Cemetery. I wouldn't go too close. But it, it was kind of humbling. You see this massive cemetery on the headland. It's a very kind of blatant reminder of where we're all going. It makes you feel pretty useless, actually. It, it doesn't matter what I've accomplished in life, you know, personally, professionally, whatever else. I, that's where I'm going. That's the end. And there's nothing I can do about it. I don't know anyone who can raise the dead. I've met some pretty you know, impressive people. James Marquette, he's very clever at lots of things. He can't raise the dead, actually. At the voice of Jesus, the dead will rise. Everyone who has ever lived, all a hundred billion people, will be raised by the voice of Jesus. Uh, if you want to read through this passage later on, because it's probably confusing your brain, look at the word all <laughs> as it comes through. Uh, Jesus raises all people, verse 22, verse 28. Everyone will come before Jesus in judgment. Sudanese, Russians, Chinese, Greeks, Argentinians, Indonesians, all people. Julius Caesar, Michelangelo, Johann Sebastian Bach, Michael Jackson, Princess Diana, Steve Irwin, everyone will be raised by the voice of Jesus. Everyone will stand before him and face his judgment. I mean, if you go into the, the city, you'll find a whole bunch of different law courts, the local court, Supreme Court, and a whole bunch of courts within the courts, you know, the appeals court and so, so forth. On the final day of judgment, there is one court and there is one judge. And there is no opportunity to sit on the fence. All that matters is whether you've put your trust in Jesus whether you've honoured the Son. The same voice that raises us up out of the grave will either say, depart from me, you evildoer, or well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, these are big claims. These are serious things to talk about. So uh, the third question is important. Can we trust Jesus with this? Can we trust him to do the work of giving life? of raising people to life. Can we trust him? See, maybe Jesus hasn't got it right. Maybe he's no better than all the other first century lunatics running around the place. 
This final section from verse 30 actually gives us all, these, all this evidence as to why we can trust Jesus. Jesus recognises the issue, and it's an important one, verse 31, look down there. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. You need more than one testimony, you need more evidence than one person to actually make a decision on this. And so from verse 31, Jesus outlines his key eyewitnesses, the trustworthy testimonies that make it very, very clear that you can trust him to work with the Father and give life. First witness, John the Baptist, verse 33. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. His testimony means you can trust Jesus to bring life and save. More than that, don't just listen to me, says Jesus. Look at the work I do, verse 36. I'm not just talk, I'm demonstrating what I can do in real life. My works testify that I've been sent by the Father to bring life. Now, as they say on TV, wait, there's more. Uh, there's much more. More corroborating evidence, more witnesses. Jesus say that the Scriptures testify about him. Now, when he says the Scriptures, what he's talking about there are the Old Testament Scriptures. The prophecies about Jesus. The predictions that God would send a king. When Jesus comes to earth, when he demonstrates that he is a long-promised Messiah, the great tragedy is that people don't embrace him. They should have. They should have been waiting for him. They should have celebrated when he said, I'm here. What do they do? Verse 43, I've come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. <laughs> you have hundreds of years of prophecies, of Old Testament scriptures. You should have been ready. Um, we were at a wedding recently and we got um, on the, kind of at the reception uh, a little gift for people who went to the reception. I think it's normally good enough just to get a free feed, but now we've got a gift as well. There was this little packet of boiled lollies I don't know, boiled lollies are not great. They're good for breaking teeth, but not much else. Anyway, the thing with them, what they've done is the, the name of the couple was actually infused into these boiled lollies. So wherever you would you know, sink your teeth into, you'd see their name. Very cute, very sweet. And, you know, maybe you meant to remember them as you go to the dentist or something. Um, wherever you cut into the Old Testament, you're meant to see the name of Jesus. Wherever you cut in at the prophets or the law or the histories or the poetry, whatever, you're meant to think, ah, Jesus is coming. There's a Messiah coming. Running through the Bible, we look forward to Jesus, the one who will come to bring life. That's where history is heading. That's what the Old Testament is about. And then there's one final killer blow at the final couple of verses there. Verse 45, second half of verse 45. There is one who accuses you. Moses, on whom you set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. He says to these Jewish leaders, your great hero talks about me. Moses, you think he's amazing. He's talking about me. He points people to me. That Jesus came to bring life should have been utterly unsurprising. But still they rejected him. They rejected the long-promised Messiah who'd come to rescue and redeem. And the great tragedy is, it still happens today, doesn't it? Jesus is widely rejected. Jesus is largely ignored by members of our family, our friends, our classmates, our colleagues, our neighbours. People will look for life anywhere else other than in Jesus. It's said that in ancient Rome, when a victorious army general returned to the city, he, the city put on a great victory parade for him. And so into this victory parade, the victorious general would go through the streets in his chariot. But here's the thing. Inside the chariot, they put a slave. 
a slave who would whisper forward into the ear of the victorious general every few minutes and just utter two words. Momenta mori. Momenta mori. Which, as you would remember from Year 7 Latin, is remember, you will die. Remember, you will die. All these achievements, all this crowd, everyone screaming your name at this great victory, it's here today and gone tomorrow. Because like everyone else, you're facing a grave. Only one ruler came who would raise us from the grave and bring us life. Only one. To trust in Jesus, to hold on to him when nothing else seems certain in life, and right now it really doesn't, is the very best thing we can do. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Shall we pray together? Why don't you bow your heads, we'll pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you that he worked with you to bring us life, to give us great assurance for the future, to bring us life and life to the full. We pray that this week you will help us to trust him, to hear what he says and rejoice, and to bring his great word of life to others. Amen.